here on Plain Spoken, I get to have people come into the studio from time to time and visit. I uh, recently got to visit with Jason Sutphin over in Arkansas Annual Conference, and he shared some really interesting information that I would like to think was helpful as they uh, gathered together and voted on disaffiliations a couple weeks ago. Uh, today, I'm joined by a former colleague from the United Methodist Church, Daniel Dennison, who is, um, to remind me your job title over at Asbury. I'm the executive pastor. You're the executive pastor of Asbury, formerly United Methodist Church. Is it now just Asbury Church for now? Just right now? Asbury Church for now. We're in a just a long season of discernment right now. And for those who don't know Oklahoma, uh, former UMC politics, um, Asbury was the very biggest church, uh, followed by St. Luke's, which also recently disaffiliated. Asbury was the very first church to publicly come out and say, we're leaving uh, under the, the leadership of the former pastor, Tom Harrison, they did a good job getting out information to the congregation, taking the votes, hiring the legal counsel, putting funds in escrow. All of this was done very smartly, and uh, they intentionally uh, designed a website and um, even put some money towards trying to equip some other local churches that were trying to, to disaffiliate at that time. But they were, they were one of the first ones out of the door because they had uh, seen a lot of the dysfunction and uh, wrongness of the Oklahoma Annual Conference. Now, before you uh, decide this is an Oklahoma-only conversation, Daniel and I have been talking before we sat down here, and we're of the mind that, yes, we're going to talk about things particular to our former conference here in Oklahoma, but we're also going to be talking about things that pertain to all annual conferences. Daniel, uh, in particular, has a good financial mindset. He has a good uh, systems mindset. He and I both believe that we have um, experiences within the United Methodist Church that um, – uh, equip us to speak not just to Oklahoma, but to the larger, broader context. And so the, the purpose of this channel, Plain Spoken, if this is your first time with me, is to equip and empower conservatives within the United Methodist Church to kind of assess the situation and know what waters they're swimming in, think through it not just theologically, but practically. So we're going to start off with the most uh, dramatic and interesting thing about both of us, both of us that we have in common, have been called to Bishop Nunn's office with credentials in hand for uh, speaking publicly about things that he did not want us speaking about. So uh, perhaps you could share the, the – well, no, no, no. Let's start with who you are, and then we'll get to that dramatic stuff. But, yeah, you need to know who Daniel Dennison is. Daniel, uh, give us a little bit about your history and, and who you are. Sure. Uh, I grew up in the DFW area and moved to Dallas, o Fort Worth. Yes, okay, Dallas, Fort Worth, Flower Mound to be specific, about halfway between Dallas and Denton. I uh, moved to Oklahoma to go to school, Boomer Sooner. I uh, went to OU from 99 to 2002, and that's really where I connected with the Methodist Church, got involved at the Wesley Foundation at OU, which uh, at the time was, was one of the largest in the jurisdiction, a really strong, healthy ministry. And that really uh, nurtured my call to ministry. I had the opportunity to come on staff there when I graduated and uh, spent six years as the associate director. And during that time, I did seminary. I did the ordination process and then uh, met my wife. I, I'll come back to that. Uh, I was uh, promoted to campus minister and executive director in 2008, and I served in that role for 10 years. So Spent 16 years on staff doing college ministry and loved it. It was, just a, it was a great season of life, but felt the the call to kind of just try something different was was getting kind of restless and ready to use my skills in kind of a different uh, a different set and explored p perhaps uh, leading some nonprofits or serving in an executive pastor role at a church and had the opportunity to move to Tulsa in 2018 and step into the role of executive pastor at Asbury. Uh, so I've been in that role for about five years now. I'm married to my wife, Mindy, for about 17 years now. We have three kids, uh, 13, 10, and 9 years old, and mm. they are uh, swimmers and lacrosse and basketball, and basically Mindy and I are full-time chauffeurs, and we, we pastor and do other things on the side. Oh, my. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to that stage. A <laughs> <laughs> so uh, executive pastor, that has to do with personnel and finances? Yeah, you know, I get asked all the time, what does an executive pastor do? And I think the answer is different for every church. Sure. kind of depends on the church's needs. A little bit depends on the skill set of the senior pastor and, and just uh, the makeup of the staff. But in, in our context at Asbury, I think a, a secular way to look at my uh, title would be like chief of staff. So I think the biggest thing I do is 
uh, kind of overseeing the staff, hiring, firing. Um, I definitely am heavily involved in the finances, but I have a CFO, so she's really in, in a controller. And so they're, they're in the weeds on, on that. Uh, other big part of my job is governance, so I'm heavily involved in all of our governance committees, which has stayed. We did not change that structure. We still uh, same model we had when we were United Methodist. So, mm-hmm. working closely with all of those boards, and uh, yeah, those are probably the biggest parts of my job. I, I I am an ordained pastor, but I I don't do a lot of the traditional pastoral roles. I preach occasionally, and you know, might go to the hospitals occasionally. I've actually got a wedding next week. It's been, gosh, it's probably been a year since I've done a wedding. So do a little bit of that, but more on the business administrative side of things. Yeah. Yeah. And you've been leading Asbury through a time of great flux. It's not just been a disaffiliation uh, shift, but Tom Harrison stepped down. You have a new pastor, Reverend Allen. No, uh, Andrew Andrew Forrest. Forrest, Thank you. Uh, I think he's just maybe a year or two older than me. Uh, Uh, He's 43 and I'm 42. Okay. How old are you? 38. Uh, but I look, you know, I've not uh, aged yes, well, so yeah. I, I could fit in with you guys. Um, but yeah, you've you've had to keep a number of plates spinning and just have the bird's eye view of, of things as you're shifting around. And yeah, so. and I, I, I think that's probably another fairly common role of an executive pastor is when large projects come up, you know, you tend to be the point person on that. So my first year there, I helped spearhead a $13 million capital campaign. So obviously that was a huge project. And mm-hmm. Uh, then that eventually bled into senior pastor transition and disaffiliation, and now I'm helping to spearhead the reaffiliation mm-hmm. effort. Are we going to reaffiliate, and what does that look like, and how are we communicating that to the congregation? So there's always kind of large projects on the side as well. Right. So as as uh, people are listening to me and you talk, things that I think are important to know, we shared in a conference for several years uh, in leadership We didn't have a lot of overlap, me and you. Uh, Ideologically, theologically, there's probably a good deal of overlap, but this isn't two longtime buddies getting together um, with... We really... We've only connected a couple of times on some shared concerns, Um, and I'm not sure I know exactly how it would be that you would characterize. How is it... What is it that orients you as you're clear on the right and the wrong of what we were a part of? your spiritual basis, your ethical basis, what what do you feel like is your uh, guiding guiding principles as you've uh, discerned, hey, the United Methodist Church wasn't a good place for me. Hey, I feel really strongly about uh, speaking truth in this situation and and guiding other people through this this particular thing. What, was it primarily scriptural? Was it primarily just a basic sense of right and wrong? What do you think what do you think that was that gives you this clarity? Yeah, I think ultimately it would just come down to scriptural authority. Uh, I think because of my view of scripture, I I saw a lot of um, brokenness and sin and dysfunction in our denomination uh, that I I think generally has a very low view of scripture and kind of it's, it's scripture, tradition, reason, experience. Whereas for me, it's scripture way up here yeah. and those others uh, down here. So, and, and as we talked about disaffiliation at Asbury, it was we, rarely did you hear us talk about human sexuality. It was constantly about the authority of scripture, right. because as we know, although progressives want to kind of cover it up, the, the, the theological divide and issues run so much deeper than the mm-hmm. presenting issue of human sexuality. And yes. at the basis of it, it comes down to where, where do you get your authority? Yes. And so for me, scriptural authority, I think, is really what guides me. Yeah. I had a good um, interview with uh, a liberal guy in Virginia, uh, Drew Enns. He got brought up on charges for, he was in campus ministry, in an ecumenical ministry, uh, performed a gay wedding ceremony. Uh, Bishop Sharma Lewis, who was there, brought him up on charges and then just let him sit. And so that's one of the things about the United Methodist Church I haven't liked is that we have a process we're supposed to follow, and a lot of bishops just press charges and then either dismiss them or... Anyway, that was a whole other thing. But as we talked about scriptural authority, um, the thing that I came to... And for some reason, the conversation... Anytime I bring this to liberals, but even some conservatives, the presenting issue, yes, was sexual ethics in light of LGBTQ politics stuff. But the root doctrinal issue is Articles 7 and 8 and the Articles of Religion, whether or not we are a fallen species or not, whether or not um, we are born broken and in need of supernatural help from God to get right, 
or if we're born uh, just lovely little creatures that just need a few little tweaks. And I really do think that's the fundamental issue that's dividing liberals and conservatives and that, that results in uh, hundreds of different little areas of conflict. But it, it seems to me that United Methodist leadership and the vast majority of United Methodists are just unable to even conceive of that conversation or reckon with those, those, those things. You and I aren't, aren't necessarily coming together to talk about those fundamental foundational things today. We're talking about some of those outgrowths of a difference in theology. And there's also, so the way, the continuum as it's usually established is liberal, progressive, left, centrist, uh, right-leaning, traditionalist, conservative, orthodox, whatever. Those are the terms we generally use. There is this kind of institutionalist thing that sits <laughs> yeah, very much somewhere so. in there. Yeah. And where I've understood institutionalism to be kind of without any kind of... Um, ethical principles whatsoever, but just concerned only with a worldly understanding of preservation of a worldly institution. And so it's clear to me that liberal leftist uh, progressive ideology is very influential in the denomination. But I'm also pretty clear that there's this thing called institutionalism, which took over and kind of married that to box the rest of us out. And then Lonnie Brooks, who is a centrist, has also said, they're going to box us out too. We're, we're in trouble. It's going to be only left... Sure. Well, and the, I mean, the progressives eventually are going to box out or just eat up the centrists because yeah. they're going to, you have to conform to us and come yeah. our way. Yeah. So at some point, yeah. the center is just going to keep moving. Yeah. I mean, well, and yeah, you see it's that already in politics, been, yeah. religion, I mean, you name it. So, and on the right, there are some people um, in the political sphere, at least saying, hey, we need to amp up. We're, I think they call themselves dominionists or something. We're going to take over the government. We're going to, bring back godly laws. I'm not really so much like that. I, I just want to, as, as we are swinging left, I saw John MacArthur's sermon the other day where he said, this side of heaven, we lose, period. We lose until Christ comes. And I'm fine with that, but I just think we have to tell the truth along the way. We have to cast a light in the dark places along the way because Christ is calling to himself those who want the truth. And then those who want things to stay hidden are going to hate us, they're going to persecute us, and that's what they do. But for at least for me in, in this ministry, I want to tell the truth. I, I was excited to have you on to tell the truth. Um, so are you ready to kind of talk about our, our anecdotes of when we offended institutional powers and, and the, the, how, that, how that played out? Oh, I, I mean, I've got a whole list of the times I've offended them, but I, I think I know the one you're talking about. So well, sure. I'm interested in the broader picture, too. So you, however you want to present that, I, we're not going to be able to hit everything, but as as uh, the denomination's going through what it's going through, as our former conference is getting together next week, what details do you think are important for people to know about? Well, I, I mean, so I, and if I'm getting too detailed here, you just stop me, but so... For, for, for me, when I first got crossways, well, probably not the first time, but the, the biggest time with the, the bishop and the conference, and my, my timeline's a little little hairy here, but it was at some point in 2019, uh, somewhere in there, uh, I was made aware of, and I think it was the 2017 financial audit, which at the time was completely confidential. Nobody knew about it. Uh, I was given a copy of the management letter uh, that was not supposed to be public. Uh, it had multiple material deficiencies. And I, while I have somewhat of a financial mind, I mean, this kind of stuff's over my head. I, I visited with a buddy of mine who runs a big CPA firm in Norman, and he said, oh, Daniel, this is, this is bad. Like, this is not a good look for the Oklahoma Annual Conference. So that was the first time I had kind of red flags going up. Uh, so I began talking a lot more with uh, Phil Greenwald, who was at St. Luke's at the time, the business administrator. Let's say one of the, I know there are several material def deficiencies. One of them was there were not monthly reconciliations of the budget, and they couldn't account for all the money at the end of the year. They could not produce a final audit. Yeah, so, so they went over two years without doing monthly reconciliations. Okay, yeah. Uh, so that's that's the, this, these are not small, you know, some people can make mountains out of molehills. That is not, that is a foundational, you are doing money wrong. Yeah, and to be clear, and to this day, I, I don't think there was any, you know, embezzlement or anything illegal. Nobody's it was made just, it, yeah. it was complete incompetence and gross mismanagement. Yeah, yeah. We had had a, a, a competent treasurer and then he was replaced with someone else. I don't say the point. I don't see the point in saying their name. Yeah. But 
there was not oversight to make sure that she was doing her jobs. There was a switch in the software. There were apparently two other employees that said they were doing their job, but the oversight just wasn't making it. Yeah, happen. well, and that that's a, a podcast in and of itself in that I think in, in the United Methodist Church, we've, we've, we put elders in positions that they have no business being in just because they're elders. Sure. Uh, like hire a CPA to do the job. Mm -hmm. Who cares if they're an elder? If they love the Lord and they they have the technical skills, let's hire them for that. Well, this particular person that was hired, once they left, actually went to work for another Christian financial firm. Yeah, and actually, I think she did have a CPA, but I can tell you, just because you have a CPA doesn't, and and you know, she had pastored for a long time. And again, I'm not trying to be critical of her. It was a, it was a bad hire. It, it shouldn't have happened. And then she was allowed to stay in that position entirely too long. Mm. So. Uh, as this kind of stuff was coming up, I'm learning about you know things not being reconciled, and um, rep and this to me is huge. Reports not being made, uh, uh, shared with uh, CFNA, so the the Conference Finance and Administration Committee are not getting uh, P and L statements. They're not getting balance sheets. They're not getting monthly financials. I mean, imagine going to your finance committee. Mm -hmm for two straight years and not providing any of that. Well, and part of what I got in trouble for was I, I became aware that our current CFNA as recently as six months ago was not getting fund balance reports. Correct. Yeah. So this is not just a personnel issue with a, a person for two years who has then moved on. This is now conference policy to be opaque. Yeah. Yeah. And so so all of that, and, and, and the thing that I, I, I suppose I could and should have done differently, and I and I told the bishop this, was I, I could have tried to do more to talk to him, to talk to the... And I actually did have uh, some phone calls and emails with the conference treasurer, and I, and I got nowhere. Uh, but I also knew that that Phil Greenwald, who, who was much more versed in this kind of stuff, had, had been going back and forth for over a year and getting mm -hmm. nowhere. And so, um, you know, I began sharing this with our finance committee at Asbury, and of course they were aghast, as they right. should have been. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we immediately made the decision to stop paying apportionments. So like, why would you give money to an organization that, that runs its books like that? Right. You, yeah. Yeah. So uh, ultimately what so, – so that was kind of what we did on a small level. But what I began doing uh, was sharing this uh, management letter with all the pastors that I knew saying, hey, look what's going on at, at the conference. And I began talking to pastors about well, until they clean up their act – we. We've got to hold them accountable. They're, they're not giving us answers. They're not providing these reports. Let's hit them where it hurts. N not because I wanted to cause harm to the conference, but I wanted to... It seemed to be the well, only way to hold being them accountable. Responsive. Yeah, yeah exactly. the, People had been on the horn with them, letting them know. And the part of the thing that's confused me all along is Bishop Nunn was... Uh, there are some leaders that they're preachers, they're people people, they're not numbers people. Sure. But my understanding was Bishop Nunn was a numbers person from his former conference that he's all about uh, this kind of work. It, do you have any theory as to why it was that he wasn't able to to write the ship or be responsive about this stuff? Well, I mean, ultimately, I, I, I think he's a poor leader. He was pitched as, hey, he's not the best people person. He's not the best preacher like Bob Hayes was. But listen, he's going to be a, a great leader. And and God love Bob Hayes. He wasn't the best Episcopal leader, um, but... Uh, I've seen no signs of leadership from, from Jimmy Nunn. When you think about the conference's response during COVID, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about the financial stuff we're talking about, it's terrible. When you think about how he's led through disaffiliation, not good. So I, I, I don't know. I think we were— The man's been a mystery to me, and I've, I've been inclined to uh, come to a negative assessment of him. But uh, as we were saying before we began filming— I began speaking out as a local licensed pastor. I could have been summarily fired at any point in yeah. time. And he did call me into his office and, and, and implicitly threaten my appointment, but he never fired me. And, um, and just because of that simple fact, I've, I've been inclined to try and give him the benefit of the doubt. I just, uh, the man's a mystery to me. And it could be that he just never fired me because I'm some small fry and no water and he just chose to believe that it was inconsequential or something. Um, but I, I, I kind of wonder, I don't know, I, I wonder about other other potential theories, but I don't really have anything else to present. So yeah, I, 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 I when when you told me you were getting called in, I, I was pretty sure you were going to get fired because I, I thought what, oh, what yeah, is, everybody was telling me I was what, getting fired. <laughs> you know what is what does he have to lose? And uh, right. so yeah, that's a great question. I, I think the reason I so I so I 
I got called into his office for speaking with other pastors saying, hey, you need to start withholding a portion. Hey, yeah. if we all start withholding a yeah, portion. I remember it being in writing on Facebook. I remember actually arguing with you at that point saying, hey, we're part of a covenant body, and you're saying, no, we have these other concerns we really need to balance. So I remember having clarity at that point and not really understanding how exceptional and dire the situation was. Yeah, And I might have theological clarity on one end, but there's still a very clear ethical... They are entrusted with millions of dollars that they are not reporting on, and something has to be done whenever the lines of communication are not are not doing it. So you were you were promoting that extreme action. Yeah, I mean it's like it's just take take your favorite nonprofit who does great work. You could say, oh, it's evil to or sinful or whatever to stop giving them money. Yeah, and which I don't know that it's true, but it, it will it hurt them? Yes, but if they are mismanaging money, right. yeah. you, I mean, when we give to organizations, we give because we have an affinity for them, we believe in the mission, but also because we, we trust that they're being good stewards. Mm -hmm. um, so, And what, I, what happened with me, and we'll get, but whenever I was in the meeting, they were overt in saying, you need to trust us. Oh, yeah. and, I, and I said, trust is earned, trust is shown. And whenever you're not willing to show these things, then that engenders mistrust, to which there wasn't anything to say to that, really, because, I mean, it's obviously true, I think, um, within the local church. I, I don't know how y'all do things in Asbury, but anybody who wants to see the financials here can see the financials. Absolutely. They have to feel good about where the money is being sent. Now, do you have any sense about how many other conferences have a similar policy of, of not reporting basic financials? I, I don't, and I, 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 I think it's... Very few, because yeah. as I've talked to friends in other conferences, they're, they're really surprised to learn how it's done in Oklahoma. So, and I don't have connections in tons of conferences, but the few I've talked to, that's not a common practice there. I interviewed um, Jeff Pospisil, who's the new CFO for the the whole Global Methodist Church. He came out of the Dakotas, and he did some very transparent financial reporting that went very well in his conference. And um, whenever I spoke with him about his relationship with us, uh, I guess I get the impression that it's either the bishop or the treasurer or the combination of the two deciding what information each conference uh, sees. And some conferences do have some transparency, and, and I'm pretty sure a number of other conferences are as opaque as ours. Now, we, on an annual basis, when we were a part of the UMC, we would get to vote on the budget each year, and we would get to see an annual expense report. But I think that was the limit of what hmm. the conference was able to see in Oklahoma, right? Uh, a basic budget. Uh, I don't know if there was anything beyond that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It was. It was very basic. It was yeah. very basic. And and here's what you you remember this. You know, as we were on our way out at that that October special called annual conference, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we were going to the mic trying to make motions not to. Not to just go out guns a blazing, but we were trying to help put some things in place to for our colleagues that we're leaving behind to, yeah. to bring more accountability and structure to that. And I can vividly remember, I won't name names, but looking at certain progressives as I'm standing at the mic or some of my colleagues are standing at the mic and they're just rolling their eyes and they just can't believe that we're doing this. Yeah. And all we're trying to do is... Say, guys, you you don't know this, but there are yeah. things not happening that should be happening, yeah. and they need to happen. And and you look at man, Bob Long, uh, the progressives turned on him like that. Yeah, and all he's doing is trying to hold the conference accountable. Yeah, he he articulated. So, did you watch the presentations he did with his church before their vote? I, I did. Yeah. So he articulated a very similar case to yours. They could not pass an audit for two years. Even afterwards, there is a lack of clarity. We had this whole financial crisis around funding our uh, uh, health insurance where we had oh, to just yeah. completely end that program and up our apportionments where uh, he says we were never able to actually show on paper any kind of deficit. Uh, that Those were just numbers that seemingly came out of thin air. He said we cannot pay apportionments in good conscience until there is good record keeping going on. And um, even after... Um, new leadership stepped in and was able to do a better job. Uh, there were still some um, – something that bothered him and me was in our most recent audit, we actually made millions of dollars that didn't correspond at all to apportionments. Might have been the CPP loans. Might have been something else. It could be investments that 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 we have well, that nobody knows about. They've got millions in the foundation, but nobody knows exactly how much or – 
how they're restricted or not restricted because they don't make that public. And so when they're saying all these churches that need to leave need to pay very significant sums of money, approaching a, a year's budget because otherwise they'll go broke, they have to maintain these ministries, well, you need to be able to show that on paper, and if it turns out you're actually sitting on millions of undesignated funds that can be used at any time, there's something very basically unethical about that. But also if, if there's a church or if there's a conference, you know, the conference is feeling like, man, we're really we're losing a lot. We don't have much. We're on a skeleton crew. We've been decreasing staff size each year. If it turns, they're sitting, turns out they're sitting on a mountain of money, then, I mean, I would like to think even progressives and liberals would be going, hey, why did we run things this way? Yeah. So this is not just a conservative thing. This no. is just like good governing. Of course. And what, what makes Jimmy Nunn all the more interesting is that he's done something completely different in the Northwest Texas Conference where he was bishop. Where yeah, that's been the, something that confused a lot of people. Yeah, where they, they're, they're opening up these funds and giving money. Churches actually received money for disaffiliating. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the Northwest Texas Conference, Wesley Foundations were allowed to disaffiliate. In Oklahoma, they're told absolutely you cannot disaffiliate because of you know what we see here in the Book of Discipline. So I mean, just playing by completely different rules. I was even told by a person in Northwest Texas that the um, the basic structure of the plan of redesignating constra- conference reserves for disaffiliation costs that that Bishop Nunn had something to do with that in Northwest Texas before he left, setting some of that groundwork. So uh, I was on the WCA for this last year's special conference where we were trying to get these transparency measures passed. And uh, we wrote Bishop Nunn beforehand and said, hey, would you, we'd like to think you think these things are good. Would you collaborate with us and let us know how to best do this for the body? And um, he never responded. Um, we made formal requests for budgetary reports, and and uh, he no the the treasurer responded saying we're not legally obligated to give them to you, so we're not going to. And then uh, at annual conference before the day of, we actually put out our legislative agenda, our goals, what we wanted to do. We posted it publicly, but then on the day of, the bishop acted completely confused by these attempts. And then um, yeah, the the feeling was why are these mean evangelicals just ruining everything for the bishop. They're just picking on our poor bishop. And then as we continue to write about these issues, he put out a letter in response to a WCA letter. I don't know why these people would just pick on us like this. You know, they just, they just seem so mean spirited. And it just, it's a very disingenuous posture to take towards. Yeah. You know, our thing was transparency benefits everybody of all theological stripes. Oh, so listen, why would one take offense I mean, to when that? When you're a Wesley Foundation director, which I was for ten years, it, like you're not only a pastor, but you're a, an executive director of a nonprofit. Mm-hmm. So you're you're, you're fundraising because the conference doesn't just give you hundred percent of your budget. And mm-hmm. so when you're fundraising, the more transparent you can be, the better it is. And, and that people want to give to organizations that are very transparent and can show a history of great financial management and stewardship. And so. Of course our churches would want that from the conference that they're sending tens, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're in another annual conference, I'm genuinely curious if you could write in the comments wherever you're watching this what kind of financial reporting your conference does. I, I've, I've had a lot of questions about this, and I, I don't have time to be calling all the conference treasurers and asking them. But you, if you don't know, you should really ask and see what kind of reporting is done and see if they, they likewise show the respect and, and honor that, that it seems to us that, that they should. Um, if, if we're clear, and I think most liberals, if you step away from this situation, they would go like, yeah, financial transparency is really key for yeah. integrity. Yeah. But – when we're talking about the assembled body of annual conference actually trying to push that, there was a huge response against it, and I've I've been frustrated ever since that day. It yeah. Just how they didn't even want no. to hear any more. No. So to me, that said that this is a, a dysfunctional, um, broken kind of family systems theory. There is there is an abusive head of the family, and rather than directly deal with that, turn on those who highlight it. Yeah, and maybe some of that ties back to the institutionalism as well. We, you know, we, we don't we don't want to speak poorly of the institution, and mm-hmm. uh, maybe that's part of it as well. Yeah, well, so well, maybe I shouldn't have said the word abusive. Maybe that's that's too much. But uh, a head of the institution that's not responsive, and that well, at least in in the case of bringing me 
to his office. It really did feel like um, a power flex, oh, dysfunctional absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Uh, what was the immediate precursor to you being summoned to his office? Was it just the the public talking, and then you got the call? Hey, come in, bring your credentials. Yeah, and the you know the official letter that comes, certified mail, and uh, yeah, it was all very. Um, it just it it was very much an intimidation tactic. Yeah, and. I knew that was a possibility, and would I have done that if I was in your situation? I, I don't know. I'd like to think I would, but I, I felt and knew that I had the, the cover of being at the largest church in the conference and mm -hmm. having a boss who'd been the senior pastor there for 25-plus years, and uh, so you know, I, I had that protection that you didn't, so God bless you for being bold, and I hope others will be bold like you. Yeah, I've definitely been advocating for other people to be bold. I just think it's weird when we have this Bible with lots of stories of martyrs and people uh, being willing to suffer for the truth and then how few pastors are really willing to do it. And, uh, and so I, I want to, I want to encourage other pastors to step up and get hurt. And then when they do make sure everybody sees it and hears it. Cause um, a lot of these pastors are going to be out of a job sooner or later anyway. I mean, yeah. it, there are a lot of people that just can't make ministry work. So you might as well have integrity yeah. as you're feeling, feeling. And a lot of, I can say now I'm in the GMC there are a lot of GMC churches that want pastors that are bold, and they don't have a pastor, you know. So I think it's a great way to exit the UMC is to just have some integrity on the way out and speak truth and get your head cut off and then go to the GMC where they know you have some integrity. Yeah, so. I mean, you know, being bold, as you know, you're, you're going to take a lot of bullets and a lot of hits, but it's a really attractive quality that people want. Yeah. And that you, so you you will find a church that wants you. You might take some hits on the way out, but... I think people are looking for bold, prophetic leaders. Absolutely. So when so you got certified mail, you're summoned to his office. Did you actually bring your credentials? No, <laughs> me no. neither. I brought, <laughs> he I, didn't ask for him though. He yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I brought I brought my senior pastor with me though. Oh so, really? Yeah. So Tom came and t Tom was actually pretty insistent that he because actually Tom did they try and block him out. No, no. Okay. Uh, Tom felt kind of bad because uh, uh, he he wasn't pushing me to do this, but he was very supportive of it. Yeah. So, and God bless him. He's, Tom's a man of integrity. He was like, you know, if the bishop wants to come after anybody, he should be coming after me because mm. I'm the senior pastor right. here. Yeah. And, and so that's why he came with me. And we, we, the conversation, once we actually got there, once, like anything, once you get in person was, was, it was okay. Was it just the three of you yeah. in that room? Yeah. Okay. So with me, <laughs> had my DS, had another DS, had the bishop, had the con uh, uh, Joe Harris. Yeah, that, that's a total intimidation. And they, that, and they wouldn't let me have uh, my, my ad board chair came from this church and they wouldn't let him in the room. Wow. Wow. And yet they're, they're, so, they're so busy, but here's the stuff they're spending their time on. We spent an hour and 15 minutes together. It was, I, I'm going to do a sub stack on it, I think. <laughs> it was really weird because I got in trouble with one other person. Um, we'd done a podcast where we just talked about lack of transparent financials. And my guest said, people in the office aren't doing their jobs, you know, which I, I, you have some insight into that too. Maybe we can talk about that in a bit, but uh, it offended supposedly everybody in the office and I needed to come in and they had an apology that wanted me to issue. The person I got in trouble with, uh, they talked to her for five minutes and then they brought me in and I said, I have some questions. And then we had a long conversation where the bishop actually was perfectly nice. I, it was, it was, it was to, it, I got the impression he hadn't thought of half the things that I was saying. Uh, they were all receptive, and, you know, Joe uh, uh, Harris was very nice. He said, just because uh, we understand you doesn't mean we agree with you. And I said, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's your prerogative. But um, I really do think it has been – well, and we're, we're united in this. I think anyone who is sane would say not transparently reporting finances obviously engenders suspicion. Obviously engenders Obviously. distrust. What are you trying to hide? It's, yeah. So, yeah, they, they set me loose on some conditions that they weren't clear about that we, we figured out over time. Did once, once you guys got together, was there a resolution at that point? Everything was great? Or was there some kind of homework they gave you? Or? Oh, I'm trying to remember. It's been four years now. I, I think, it. I, you know, he, he demanded a, an apology. I don't think I had to do a written apology. And... Um, that was and to, to basically to not speak ill, to not um, 
I don't I don't think I was told like not to share information, but basically not to speak negatively at all of the annual conference. Okay. And, and then and suggesting to other people to withhold um, apportionments was was undermining his authority and undermining the annual conference. And I wanted to ask, well, what about the <laughs> lack of transparency? Like, how is that? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I didn't I didn't ask that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I, I played it pretty safe. I, once I got to, I, I, you know, I was kind of, yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I apologize. And, um, cause I just kind of wanted to be done with sure. it. I didn't think yeah. it would do me any good to have a one-on-one -on -one argument with the bishop. Right. Well, and that's a decision. That's a personal decision. Everybody has to make about, it's one thing to speak the truth publicly. It's another thing to do so privately. How much of the truth do I speak? How much of a opportunity do I give for connecting with this person and giving them a chance to repent versus how much do I think this is just a foregone conclusion and it's really just uh, and there I mean there are plenty of situations I get in where no I'm not going to try and reach the truth with this person over the course of an hour because we're not going to reach it together. Yeah, and I I did share you know some of the same concerns I you know Bishop you have to understand how this looks when you all and and, and he. I kind of got the company line of you just you need to trust us. Um, so, yeah. I don't know why people, I don't know why anyone thinks that's a sufficient <laughs> way to be in dialogue. Well, I think that's an institutional mindset. I mean, the only, well, so the, the thing that Rob Renfro has hit um, the bishops on is paternalism. You know, as they have tried to moderate the conversation around misinformation, he says, um, these are grown people that have like grown up jobs and it's completely inappropriate for adult bishops to step in and say, "Here's what's what what you can listen to. Here's what you can't. Here's here's the and and it's also a paternalistic uh, posture to take, saying, "Well, I know you have some issues with the way I do things, but you need to fall in line and trust." Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm a grown man. Um, you're not my daddy. You know, you're not my pope. We we're we're Protestants, and trust is earned. Um, so it just it's. I would say it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of how power works or should work in the United Methodist Church. Well, and it's it's laughable and naive for them to take it's one thing to take it with nobodies like you and I, but they're also saying that to you know, I, I have people on my finance committee that are CEOs of multi billion dollar companies and you're telling those people, you know, just just trust us. I, no, that's naive. Okay, yes. I hope this is obvious to anyone watching. I really do hope a lot of people have hard conversations after this. A lot of people just don't have clarity because it's not their forte, but this is just a, fa a fundamental part. Jesus talked about money all the time. All money the time. directly has to do with your faith, and the way that faith communities use money is a direct reflection of their, their integrity as Christians. So after that episode of being called into the office. That wasn't the end of the conversation. Uh, Asbury banded together with St. Luke's and some other very large churches in our conference and forced a conversation with the bishop, right? There there, there was, yeah, and I, I wasn't allowed of that. It was only the senior <laughs> pastors that, uh -huh. that went to that. Um, but, it, you know, it. I, I don't even, I, one, I wasn't there. Of course, it was told to me, but I, I don't remember all the details of that. But they they didn't get a ton of satisfactory answers at that meeting, but uh, you know it was nice that they at least got some face time and got to sit down and, and talk about it. But nothing really changed as far as reporting and you know hey we're gonna now share these monthly reconciliations and financials. What did change, and to the conference's credit, once we really push push them on it, I mean. They got rid of the conference treasurer. They yeah. hired an outside CPA firm. They did the things they needed to do. And they passed the last few audits. Yeah, but for some reason, they continue to not have transparency. And I I can't speak for the last six months or so. Maybe it's all fully transparent now. But even up until we left in October, it was absolutely not. And CFNA continued to not get these documents. Well, if you remember at the special called conference last year, we were pushing, pushing finan on financials. And finally, um, it wasn't the treasurer who got up, but it was, um, I want to say it was somebody on the board of trustees. He said, next year before annual conference, we will have an open session where people can come and ask questions on the finances and we will be transparent and report to you guys. And to my knowledge, they never hosted such a thing. Yeah, well, I wonder if anybody left remembers that or even cares. Maybe our I former saw, colleagues just don't even care. I, I don't know how they couldn't, but. Well, they're, they're concerned about the culture war stuff. They're not concerned about, I yeah. mean, so yeah. we were watching before we turned the camera on, uh, Matt Patrick, a clergy here, uh, United Methodist clergy in Oklahoma, 
uh, he and a crew are presenting uh, language of um, uh, we want to protect the historic Christian Orthodox faith, but we also want a new sexual ethic. Um, that's the thing that they're going to want to focus on. They're wanting to do their part to claim Oklahoma for the left, um, ostensibly holding the line there, but that's that's just not how these things work. So that's where their energies are. I, I don't know of anyone on the left who's really concerned with responsible fiscal policy. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't seem like it. And I'm not even familiar with people on the right who are going to be beating that drum when they get together. I'm, I, yeah, well, I think for, for most pastors, the financial stuff is, is a little bit foreign and people feel out of their comfort zone. And so they're probably afraid to even ask the questions. And I, I can understand that. Uh, but yeah, it, I feel like some of us have done enough to kind of educate and get it out there. And it's it's baffling that more people aren't. Like the, the moment I heard about... Or, or suspicions of what was going on. Like mm-hmm. I started asking questions and started to dig it in. And, mm-hmm. you know, we've made this stuff much more transparent and Bob Long over the last year has, and yet it still seems like most are just kind of trusting it's going to be okay. Yeah, what, what they did with Bob Long at the special called conference, what, three weeks ago, was um, they had an old DS uh, that had served My old him. DS. Got up and made a personal accusation oh, against yeah. him um, that was uh, really petty. And then the bishop wouldn't let Bob speak to it. I was the one who ended up speaking after that, and uh, the vote went the right way. But um, their 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 response was not to res- to address the merits of the argument. Rather, it's to attack the integrity of the person who calls the question. Um, all right, so I, I think we've laid out the broad strokes here, and I hope it's clear to anyone who's watching who's not in Oklahoma just how big the implications here and how important it is to be asking these questions. What I'd like to spend the rest of the time on is the outgrowths, the specific things that we see from this institutional preservation culture, this paternalistic culture of you are here to trust us, to give us your money, to obey, and we will use all the levers of power to bring you into line if you don't conform. So you and I experience that personally being brought into the bishop's office, but you as uh, now an executive pastor with the bird's eye view, you've seen a number of ways in which the conference, our conference, but also probably a lot of other conferences, um, uh, uh, behave that are connected to this. So whether we're talking about financial practices, whether we're talking about mistreatment of, of laity or clergy that, that are not quite online, uh, there's no way we can cover all the things that you know today. But I, I do see, yeah, you've got notes. <laughs> so um, what, what other things do you think are important to know about, um, I would say that this is, this is not a just institution, the United Methodist Church. This is not one concerned, not just with transparency, but, but fairness. And so in what ways have you seen that, that shown such that people are justified to consider leaving? Well, uh, I'll, I'll give you one example, and you can choose to, to keep this or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is not publicly known. Uh, so, so we were going through the disaffiliation process while we were also searching for a senior pastor. And you know, we went through all the, the right – we followed protocol, if you will, on mm-hmm. senior pastor, even though internally we knew we were disaffiliating. The conference didn't at the time. Uh, our Andrew Forrest was named and allegedly appointed senior pastor or named in, uh, I think it was February of last year, and it was the following month, March 6th, when we went public with our disaffiliation. Uh, fast forward to um, middle of August, we had just launched, a, so a- Andrew started uh, August, well, July 1st, but he didn't really step into the role August 1st. Um, we had just started a Thursday night worship service, his first week there, and he had just finished preaching. It was great. He was on his drive home, and he gets a call from the DS, and she says, uh, hey, um, somebody at your office keeps calling the the conference about your your." There's mistakes with the billing on your health insurance and your pension, and and, and yes, we'd been hounding them for for six weeks. It wasn't right, and and uh, she said, well, you, you know, you don't, you're not appointed, so you don't you don't have health insurance. And he said, what, what do you what do you mean I'm not appointed? Well, yeah, when Bishop Nunn and and Bishop McKee found out you all were disaffiliating, they chose not to appoint you. And he said, and he's getting angry, of course, at this point. You're telling me I don't have health insurance for my family? Mm-hmm. And her response was, well, yeah, I guess not. 
I mean, that's either at at best just ignorance and mismanagement, and at worst, it's pure evil. Pure evil. Now, as it turns out, and here's what's so funny, uh, he actually what well. He, so he he did have health insurance. So we immediately the next morning called uh, the insurance provider for our lay yeah, employees course, yeah. and, and added him to it. Yeah. Uh, our uh, so of course our SPRC chair gets involved and um, contacts the bishop. gets uh, gets an email from the bishop. Uh, yes, that's correct. He's not appointed. Kid you not. Thirty minutes later, a follow up email. Up. Oh, uh, never mind. Forget that last email. He actually is appointed. <laughs> So I think maybe it's just gross mismanagement. Maybe there's a little bit of evil. I don't know. But but that's just an example of the pettiness of hey, we're gonna we're gonna actually screw with this guy's livelihood. Yeah. Because this church is is disaffiliating. Yeah, uh, uh, pettiness is is something we can spend a little bit of time on. I did a segment on um, Bishop Nunn requiring the credentials of. Uh, clergy that were transferring to the GMC. He's saying, nope, there's not going to be any transfer. You're going to give them in. Those are yeah, legal documents. Yeah, one of those. And uh, for local licensed pastors, that's true. In the in the Book of Discipline, it does state that. But when you're an ordained elder or a deacon, there is no such provision. And in fact, the, the Judicial Council had just made a decision yeah. saying as much. Yeah. And in his letter, he said, don't care what the Judicial yeah. Council says. That, that doesn't apply here. But the only explanation I have for that kind of decision is pettiness. Can you think of any other theory? Oh, it's... I want to be gracious. <laughs> it's it's petty and, and bitter. I mean, there's a lot of bitterness. Uh, I, I think I think Jimmy did not want this to happen on his watch. I think he had in his mind that he would be able to hold the Oklahoma conference together. Uh, I don't know that he ever said it in as many words, but I, I think he had really hoped for that. Cause, cause, and, and this is another layer to the onion, and, and you, I think, know this, but for a long time, he was saying churches can't disaffiliate. If you're a conservative church, you cannot disaffiliate under paragraph 2553, which, if you read 2553, is actually right. You shouldn't yeah. be able to disaffiliate right, yeah. if you're a conservative church. Yeah, yeah. it was um, written for left-leaning yeah, congregations, yeah. assuming that the the denomination would uphold the Book of Discipline, and that was the false assumption on which all of it was built. Yeah, I can't remember where I was going with that now, though. Well, he imagined himself to be the person. Oh, hold it all yeah, together. yeah, and and so you know, hey, if I don't let conservative churches out, we're gonna hold it together. And mm -hmm. when when Asbury went public, and we you know, and we had been working on this for a year behind the scenes, uh, that's when they did an about face and decided, okay, well, we we are gonna create a path for mm -hmm. conservative churches to leave. And and from that point on, in fact, he and this is so child, childish, in my opinion, he 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 sent a text message. A, course a text message to tom harrison the, the day or maybe the night of uh, uh when we went public with it and so it's i don't remember the exact words but something to the effect of you know i feel so betrayed by you and i you know i thought we were friends or something like that and i remember to, tom, tom's wife telling him tom you were never friends and because tom, tom said the same thing like i feel so bad that i've betrayed my friend and dana said you were never friends and let me tell you how that truth that, that was tom's mom died large senior pastor largest church in your conference heard nothing from the bishop Mm. Nothing. I mean, so not really a leader, not pastoral. I'm not sure what he's doing. Well, yeah, I, I already understood that he's not a big people person. Sure. I'm not really either. That's why I'm an executive pastor. So the, the mystery to me is just why why the lack of, I mean, I would just expect the paperwork to be so great. You know, I would expect yeah. everything to be, all the T's to be crossed, all the I's to be dotted. Yeah. And I, I would expect a bishop to be like, here, look how orderly everything is. And it's kind of the opposite. It's just you're going to have to trust us. And granted, he is bishop of three conferences. Yeah. Um, I'm sure he's very busy. I, did he ever live in Oklahoma or did he only ever live in Texas? I mean, he had a residence, but, uh, you know, he stayed there occasionally. But, no, he, he was living. And, and, of course, COVID helped with that. Yeah. I, uh, he he was in Lubbock full time during COVID. Well, and for a while he was only Oklahoma bishop, but then yeah, after, oh, yeah. But, but even when he was Oklahoma bishop, I don't think he, he ever spent totally. A, lived I mean, he 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 had a house, but I he yeah. I'm told he was not there a lot. Well, he's still kind of close. Apparently, the uh, the bishop of uh, the Katanga region in in uh, Africa lives in Georgia here in Oklahoma. He doesn't even live in in Africa, <laughs> so well, it's you, not so bad. I mean, if you listen to the language when he would talk, he he would it was sort of an us versus them. It was Oklahoma was never home. It was like it was like you all. 
but where, whereas Bishop Hayes, it was like we and Oklahoma's oh, yeah. home. Yeah. So you just listen to his language. It was very subtle, but Oklahoma was not his home. Well, the, I know the main petty thing that we would be really bad if we didn't spend time on is uh, treatment of retired clergy. So, yeah. uh, and you can speak a little bit more about the particulars of that, I think, than than I can. But there's, I know, retired clergy tied to your church, to to First Tulsa, um, that have really gotten a raw deal here, where um, a number of decisions have been made. It's hard to justify them outside of just vindictiveness. Yeah. So, so if you're a retired clergy in other conferences, it's probably less of a, a, it's not really a big deal maybe if you have to give up your your conference membership. But in Oklahoma, when you do that as a retiree, you lose a, a medical supplement that we have provided, I'm not sure for how many years, to retired clergy. It's $2,400 annually, $4,800 if your spouse was on your medical insurance. That was one piece of the extortion fee that we had to pay when we disaffiliated. Mm-hmm. So... Um, it was maybe a month ago when the bishop sent a letter to all retired pastors um, reminding them very sternly that they had to be affiliated with the United Methodist Charge Conference and you cannot, you can't work, you can't volunteer. You know, basically, you can't be associated with a non-United Methodist Church, which to my knowledge has never been an issue. I mean, I, I know of retired clergy who attended non-denominational churches and Lutheran church, you know, their grandkids went there or whatever. It was never. Well, and I don't an know issue. how much you know. This was in particular to say no. The, the Global Methodist Church had its ordination event and some of the the ordinands wanted UMC leaders that had raised them in the tradition to be able to lay hands on them with their own robe and stole right. on. And the bishop was making clear, if you are ever in your robe and stole in any capacity other than in your church, your ministry, you are, uh, w- I forget what the exact threat was, but he was making clear that is not appropriate. And I talked to some liberals who were like, I, I operate outside of the United Methodist capacity without permission all the all time. All the time, yeah. And so it just sets a very, it's, it's um, cutting off your nose despite your face, I think, is the... It's, well, uh, it's back to the pettiness, and yeah. I mean, it, very, very petty. So I'll give you a couple examples. So we uh, got a longtime pastor on our staff who officially retired from the United Methodist Church when we disaffiliated because he, he wanted to you know maintain his pension and all that, mm-hmm. uh, but, but still works for us full-time. He's still a pastor on our staff. He just is, is retired with the UMC. I guess I could understand going after somebody like that. Hey, if you're working for a now disaffiliated church, you know, that's inappropriate and you need to send in your conference membership. Mm. I can sort of see that, although I think it's pretty petty to take that medical benefit away. I mean, this is somebody that served faithfully for years. Who, mm-hmm. who cares if they're with somebody else? So that's that's one example where, okay, maybe I can see that. But you've got retirees who, I'll give you another example, we've got a guy in our church, mid-80s, his health is failing, uh, he's on a fixed income, served the conference faithfully for years. He doesn't work for us, he's not a volunteer for us, he can hardly move, Mm. and they're telling him if he doesn't basically leave Asbury and affiliate with the United Methodist Church, he needs to turn in his conference membership, which at which point he would lose this financial benefit that uh, he relies on, and, and to me, that is just so petty and bitter, and maybe downright evil. It's weird. I know that they are very busy at the conference office. Like before we disaffiliated, I went there a few times. A lot of movement, a lot of work needs to be done, um, trying to process stuff and, and all the moving pieces. It's just odd to me that they have that much time and energy. <laughs> Or to have an hour and a half meetings with you with, you know, five conference officials. Like, yeah, what, what are they really spending their time on? It doesn't seem like it was apparently not on reconciling the financial statements. Yeah, is there's – we would like to think – there is such a thing as, like, market forces. Like, we're not the only – Methodism is not the only tradition that's declining in the United oh, States. Sure. Like, there's decline everywhere. Some places – some traditions are declining much faster than others. But, um, I mean, there's been a slow and steady dec- decline for decades. Whenever I was – I hope you do take the time to watch the Jeff Pospisil interview I did. I'll, I'll put it out next week. But he was the conference treasurer in the Dakotas for a few years, and they completely realigned um, their financial ministry and a lot of their structure um, to undo 
the paternalistic culture to give trust to local churches. They actually returned money to local churches when they had a conference, um, uh, yeah. uh, uh, when they were in the black. They, they um, I can't remember all the things that they did, but they actually were one of the only conferences that recorded growth as they reversed the policies and, and the culture of their uh, conference. And I'm of the mind... I'm of the mind that the culture that has just become normative throughout the whole United Methodist connection, which has been overrun at the top by left-leaning progressive uh, 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 ideology, that that actually leads to uh, exacerbate it. Well, I was showing you before we began, I put together yeah. all the numbers of all the annual conferences, and in a three-year period between 2019 and 2021, uh, average worship attendance for the whole United Methodist uh, in America denomination went down forty percent. That's almost that's close that's to half. Incredible. Well, um, what other stuff? Is there anything else that you think would be good for people before annual conference looking at this to 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 know about? Well, I mean, if you want another example of I, I think real mismanagement, and I mean, we've sort of gotten on, we've sort of moved past that, but uh, I can tell you the story, and if you want to use it, you Do can. It. Yeah. So. Um, and, and many people in Oklahoma, well, some people are familiar with this, and I, I, it's been a while. I don't remember the years, but we had a, a church plant in Norman, a Bridgeview United Methodist Church, that um, I was asked to come in and basically serve as an interim. They had to get the senior pastor out for a, a lot of reasons, and I was basically this, – and this was, uh, this was under Bishop Hayes, so this, this goes back further. Um, hey – Daniel, they've got extreme amount of debt. They're about to go bankrupt. Can you just go in and kind of figure out what's going on? And so, so that's what I did. My first day on the job, I fired the entire staff because literally they could not pay the staff. Yeah. Um, what I found out over time was they had been approved for give or take a hundred thousand dollars. I think it was a two point three or two point four million dollar loan to build their building in Northwest Norman. Uh, two point four million dollars for a church that was averaging about seventy or eighty on mm. Sunday. Now, the United Methodist Church, to its credit, has a lot of levers built in for accountability, so that something like that should never, ever happen, right? Did uh, they do it without conference approval? Uh, no, they went through the by district board and all you know all of the things that that was supposed to happen. Um, and they got approval even though they really shouldn't have. Were they seeing the revenue to justify? No. no. They didn't have the attendance. They didn't have the income to justify such a thing. Okay, go on. Well, that that's really the, the biggest part of the story. So I was there for a few months, and um, we, we were able to – so I, Bridgie was actually my sponsoring charge conference uh, when I started the candidacy process. So I had a lot of relationships there, and – uh, we were able to to get some people back that had left because of financial mismanagement. They were asking the kinds of questions we had been asking the conference, and they weren't getting the answer. These are you know savvy business people that were like, if I can't get these answers, I'm not going to stay here. So uh, these people came back, and we kind of leveled out. They they brought in another interim pastor who who did a, a nice job while he was there, and then eventually they they had an appointment. But here's this church that's just saddled with this debt that they cannot afford. Um, the conference was helping them pay for it. Now, at some point, and I don't know when this happened, but it happened totally under the radar, and I, I don't know what the approval processes need to be, but the conference actually purchased land from Bridgeview. So, so Bridgeview bought 30 or 40 acres, and I was a member of the church when this happened, and then eventually they built the building. Basically, to bail out Bridgeview, they, they bought 10 or 15 of the acres. But I think the, what you're telling me if I'm understanding it correctly, is even though it's not on the budget, the, the conference uh, uh, used funds that were entrusted to them by little old ladies putting their money in the offering plate and churches like mine yeah. to then um, offset the cost of a multi-million dollar investment that shouldn't have ever been made. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And, that, and that did happen under under Jimmy Nunn's leadership. That was within the last couple of years okay. uh, that, that they purchased that land. And the, the, the other alternative... You know, someone might say, well, they were going to default on the loan and they would have lost the building. And then a good responsible leadership would have said, well, yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. But instead they said, no, we're, we're not going to – well, and yeah, you see this kind of desperation right now as um, churches in vital urban areas are wanting to disaffiliate. They're saying, no, 
uh, we're not willing to let go of this real estate. This is a this is a, a foothold for the United Methodist oh, Church in well, a vital area. I mean, they're doing that to First Methodist Oklahoma City right now. I've got a good friend who's the chair of the trustees there, and and they their process was stopped dead in the water. They they thought they were meeting to uh, I don't think it was to take the vote, but like kind of the step before taking the vote. And basically at that meeting they were sideswiped by the the DS and conference officials saying that you're not going to be allowed to take a vote. We're going to do a viability study on your church and. Uh, that's still playing out. They right. have now moved that senior pastor. Apparently, there's going to be a big announcement there on Sunday. I don't know what that announcement is. Oh, interesting. Is. I hadn't heard that. Um, but yeah, and the only reason is because, I mean, that property is probably worth $50 million or more dollars. So right. the conference doesn't want to lose it. Yeah, well, and it's just right there uh, in the middle of things in Oklahoma City. I mean, it was right by the Fura, uh, uh, Murrah Medical uh, uh, the Murrah Federal Bombing. Building. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So it's just, uh, yeah, they little hick towns like this. I'm glad they were it's like, yeah, goodbye. Lovely. If you goodbye. all have never been to Nawada, you need to come. It's lovely. Well, I love, I love Nawada, but I, I love being here. But I also, you know, they care about the urban upper class. Yeah, surrounded by. They don't care about rural. You know, see you guys later. You know, we'll pay the bare minimum. We'll yeah. let you go. And I'm very glad pay, for that. Oh yeah, we uh, had to pay. I mean, bare minimum is generous, but. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, I was glad they let us go, but it is really strange how overtly they. Um, they just say you're a rich church in a rich area. We're going to hold on to you. You're, yeah. you're a poor church in a poor area. We don't care. It, it's just like so overtly class based um, yeah. in their priorities. So, and then that's what I was connecting to the church you were just talking about. It was in a a, a, a growing suburban area. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So yeah, it's a mission area. Who cares if they made some bad financial decisions? We're going to bail them out using the funds that we get from these rural areas that could really use yeah. that money on their own. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it just it it betrays an ideology or yeah. a, a priority system. Yeah. So, what what are you hoping as the annual conference gets together? I mean, you and I are out of it now. So, but I mean, we know and love a lot of people who are meeting together next week. What are you hoping? Are you hoping? Is there anything left to hope for, or is it just like, all right, guys, you're you're lost. See ya. You know, I hope some more of you get out. Uh, how do you feel? Yeah, I, I mean, this is gonna sound callous, but I mean. Ultimately, I, I just I don't really care. I mean, I want the best for for my friends that are left, and um, but it's that's a different season of my life at this point. So I, I guess what do I hope for? I, I hope those that want to get out and are trying to get out. I sure hope they get out <clears throat> next fall. Uh, boy, it's going to be tough. They've they've lost. You know what we went from? It was like a ninety-two percent, give or take, when we those that disaffiliated in October, and then this most recent one was what seventy percent, seventy-one percent. What oh. was the vote for you? For, for, oh yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. So dropped more than twenty percent. If it drops another twenty percent, they're not out. You got to have a simple majority. So I, yeah. I, I'm fearful that that those that are left, and I, I suspect there's going to be another. 30 or 40, and, and another wave of money. I heard Mustang voted this week. I mean, that's a that's a good-sized church. Uh, First Methodist Broken Arrow, I think, is on their way out. Christ in Tulsa. I mean, so there's some uh, some fairly good-sized church, so you're going to have a lot more money leaving. So I hope those churches that want to get out are able to get out. And for those that are left, um, you know, God bless them. We have completely different ideologies and theologies, and, and we see ministry different, yeah. but I certainly don't wish ill upon them i i hope i hope i hope that that the conference cleans things up and and uh stops being so petty that they become more transparent and that they can you know flourish with what's left yeah when i when i publicly left the united methodist clergy page and i talked about how toxic the culture on there was there were a number of people that had considered me a friend that wrote me and said I was really personally insulted by the the accusations you leveled against me, and I said I wasn't talking about you. Why would you identify with the people I described? And that's my worry. Is as people maybe watch me and you, is there a lot of people who within the conference would share a lot of concerns that that you and I have, even if they're on the ideological other side. Our problem isn't necessarily with people who believe differently from us, but it's people who use power irresponsibly um, to to manipulate people in situations in ways that are not just. But I, I know that a lot of people who would be aligned with us on a lot of priorities would watch this and go, uh, I, they're attacking me. They're attacking my conference. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure I'll get some hate mail from this. But Well, I just, I, I think we've been clear. We're frustrated with Bishop yeah. Jimmy Nunn. 
but I, at least me personally, I'm not wanting to attack every single member of the Oklahoma. And well, I don't think you do either. No. You, you've already said you have friends there. Sure. So we, we want what's good for the conference, but part of that is naming what's bad for the conference. And that we weren't able to do that in the open yeah. when we were under the thumb of the conference leadership. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, when you, when you name stuff that's bad, you know, boy, people come after you. I'll give you another example at, at our disaffiliation meeting on March 6th. Do you know, John Vick? Yes. Young pastor. Yes. Just sweetest kind. I, I mean, think I know this story. Sweetest, kindest guy in yeah. the world. Mm-hmm. And, and Tom brought him up on stage and asked him a few questions about his undergrad at Oklahoma city university. And, and John, he, he didn't, belittle anybody, but he just talked about how progressive it was and how how really hard that was for him, and it was very shocking and eye-opening. You, you think you're going to a United Methodist Seminary, and what he encountered there yeah. was just the total opposite, and he got all kinds of hate. I mean, just nasty stuff from colleagues, from some people who I would have considered uh, friends, and I, I, just, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. And, and I mean, if you know John's heart... Uh, it makes it even worse. Well, it was to the point where um, there was at least one person who had Arvis BP'd that he was coming to John's wedding and then rescinded the, yeah, the yeah. said, I'm not coming no more. I don't like you anymore. Yeah. So yeah, people get intensely personal about this. And and I, I don't want to lie and say I'm not, I don't have any personal feelings about this. I hope I, I've been fair in what I've said, but like just because there's emotions involved doesn't mean you... You can't speak the truth. A lot of times that's when it's most important to speak the truth. And that's when it's really important to hear the truth, listen to the truth. And um, I just worry that everybody is so reactive right now that the battle lines are drawn and they're just not going to hear anything they don't want to hear. I would like to think that, I mean, if we're talking about stuff that isn't worthy or important, then I hope somebody can show me. But I think we're talking about fundamental important things in any organization. Yeah. And anybody theologically should be able to hear that and go, that really is an issue, and we really need to bring that under alignment. Um, so I guess I want to exhort you, if you if you hate me theologically, if, if you disagree with me and Daniel fundamentally on, on theological stuff, do you at least hear the wisdom of what we're talking about? Can you can you acknowledge that, that a number of these practices are, are very disturbing and really shouldn't continue, even after you've purged the conservatives out? Surely you don't want this stuff to be a part of your 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 conference. So um, let's end on a positive note. Um, Asbury Church is now free. You're Methodist still, right, in your DNA? Oh, yeah. So uh, do you have any idea how it is in the near future that you guys are going to continue to to carry the Methodist banner, make disciples of Jesus Christ? Um, is there any kind of connectional... Uh, clarity you have as to how you're going to cooperate with other churches, um, or is everything just kind of still up in the air? And uh, is anything solidifying? Uh, no, we're a ways from that. We uh, we we're really taking our time with this. We we want to really seek the Lord's guidance on this and and do what we think He's calling us to do. And rushing into His decision just doesn't seem wise. So. We've had quite a few meetings. Uh, we had three meetings in the last six weeks or so with uh, three different denominations, the Free Methodist, the Global Methodist, and the Evangelical Covenant Church. And that by no means uh, means that, oh, those are the three finalists. Those are just three that seemed interesting to sure. us. And they were they were nice and they were helpful, but we didn't walk out of any of those going, oh my gosh, we are so fired up. Let's, let's go join this denomination. So uh, our next step, we we want to attend, and I wish I wish you know the the GMC had their big event in the Woodlands a few weeks ago, and I, we want to attend something like that uh, to just go and be around and ha- ha- how how do these people worship and how do they interact with one another? So that's something we want to do. Uh, we may take a look at the Anglican Church. Uh, we're we're kind of interested in them as well. Um, staying independent is is an option, um, but there there seems to kind of be this sense of just an uneasiness around that. We, we would like to remain connectional. Uh, so how does it all shake out? I don't know, but I, I would guess we're probably more than a year away from, from finalizing on a decision. In the meantime, uh, you know, we, we still have relationships both uh, locally and globally. I mean, we, we've got several key 
uh, focus areas globally. Uh, one of those is in Estonia. We have a long time history with the Methodist Church there. I'm actually, my daughter and I are going to Estonia next month. Uh, cool. We're going to be at the Baltic Theological Seminary graduation, which is a seminary that we have heavily supported. Uh, we'll actually be at the very beginning of their annual conference when they are going to vote as a conference to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. Uh, we have a long history with Juan Wesley Seminary in Monterey, Mexico. And so, you know, we are going to continue partnerships with, with places like that. Um, what does it look like, you know, locally and within the United States? I, I think probably still remains to be seen, but, sure. uh, yeah. you know, we would, we would love to stay connectional for sure. Right on. Well, I'm excited to see what you do. And I just like, you know, sometimes uh, it becomes clear that huge churches are just governed by, uh, you know, mostly just feelings, and and I, I just like that Asbury is governed by somebody with an eagle eye view who's looking at the options and and keeping things on a solid table and and uh, whatever decision y'all make, you know, uh, the the future is unknown, but it's nice to be making decisions not reactively but informed and proactive. So yeah. I wish you well in all that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and we're having a great time. I mean, just the, the Lord's done a great work between disaffiliation and and getting a new senior pastor. There's just a, a tremendous energy and sweet spirit at the church right now and it's it's fun we're having fun doing ministry right. and uh we we had a uh i can't remember what we called it but on mother's day uh we had a kind of a baptism and new member sunday and that was a big part of the services we had uh, 25 baptisms um and 108 people joined the church and it was just it was really exciting to see mm. teenagers and adults getting baptized and it was just a party, and uh, so we're really excited about what the Lord's doing in our midst. Well, you were kind to take a day off from your uh, uh, day running a huge church and, and drive out to a small church and spend time with me and TJ. So, Daniel, thanks for coming out, and we may or may not do a, a follow-up on on any of this stuff. There's a lot of details that, that we didn't have time to cover, but yeah. it's about all the time we should spend on <laughs> this today, I think, and uh, if it's been a blessing to you. I'm glad if uh, if you think anything that that I said in particular wasn't fair, then please uh, correct me. I never want to be making accusations or speaking out of my depth, um, but I hope you understand my heart is um, you know even if I'm not in the United Methodist Church anymore, I sure don't want it to be a, a toxic or dysfunctional place. If you come from a perfect annual conference that that does everything great, I'm so happy for you. But if you're a part of a, a conference that that also has paternalistic practices of uh, opaqueness and keeping things hidden, and you're hearing, you've just got to trust us. Uh, well, you've at least had an hour here of, of stepping into a world where that's not really a realistic way to run things. So anyway, I don't know what you're going to do with the time you spent with us, but I'm glad you spent it with us. Uh, go ahead and like and share and subscribe if you haven't already. And um, I, I always treasure the, the comments, so let me know what you think, and I'll see you next time.